Joel Hom. I'm a senior engineer with Contec Engineered Solutions. Uh, my role at Contec, I, I primarily work with um, our bridge consultants, our, 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 uh, our, our sales team, and as well as uh, owners and engineers and contractors to develop buried bridge projects. Um, you know, we'll come in at any stage, whether it's at initial conception or at some point during planning or design or even value engineering, uh, just, just to help look at things in a different way. So a lot of what I do is customized to meet uh, uh, to meet site requirements. Um, and, and as we go through this, hopefully you'll you'll understand what the benefit of that is. Um, in addition to my role at Contact, I'm also involved with a lot of uh, committees with the Transportation Research Board, ASTM. Um, ARIMA, um, National Association of Accounting Engineers, and, and other groups to help develop and, and um, work on communication and educational resources and, and maintain uh, and, and improve on existing design standards. So I, time's kind of limited here. So I, what I'm planning to do is start out with uh, just a really brief introduction of what buried bridges are for those who may may not be familiar with them, as well as uh, um, give you a little bit of an idea of how to get started with, the, with looking at them as an alternative to a conventional bridge. Um, and then we got a couple of detailed case studies uh, that are actual bridge replacement projects using buried bridges. Um, um, they're, they're both up in the Northeast, mainly just because I have good information on these projects, but these are being done all around the country. Uh, lots of different sizes and shapes and, and situations. Um, and then if we have room, if we have time at the end, um, there's some additional additional project snapshots we'll go through. Um, if you download the presentation, those are gonna be in there. So if we don't get to them, you'll be able to still see them on your own. So what is a what is a buried bridge? Um, it, it's generally pretty much as the name as the name indicates, it's a it's a bridge size structure that's buried in the ground. So the, the structure itself combined with the backfill around it work together through soil structure interaction to support the loads. So the, the, the structure itself and the backfill are both part of the bridge. One can't really live there without the other. Um, steel buried bridges are, are, are corrugated um, and they're flexible, which gives you a lot of a lot of benefit from a design and performance standpoint, and they can do a lot of things that uh, rigid structures like like precast arches or precast bridges, and even a lot of conventional bridges bridges can't do just because of the types of movements that they can accommodate. Uh, the buried bridges have been the subject of a lot of webinars, conference sessions, workshops, um, even in individual um, uh, seminars and things like that. Uh, sponsored by the Transportation Research Board, National Association of County Engineers, um, short, short Span Steel Bridge Alliance, like we're doing here, led some DOTs. We've covered over the last 10 years or so a lot of different aspects in design, accelerated construction, resilience, service life, um, special applications, load rating, uh, load volume roads. So that this, if you're interested in this topic and these types of structures, there's a lot of inf a lot of resources, information out there that we could point you to. And then everything you're going to see here is covered and and included with ASHO LRFD in terms of materials design and construction, and none of it's proprietary. So anybody, if you like what you see, anybody can ask for these types of structures and specify them on projects. Um, and it would meet all ASTO and and um, any kind of uh, bidding requirements. Um, so when we're talking about flexible braid bridge materials, we're talking about cor corrugated steel. There are two primary uh, corrugation profiles that are that are pretty common. Um, the the first is a six by two inch steel corrugation, and then there's an aluminum nine by two and a half inch corrugation profile. So that that's the corrugation profile is is the width from peak to peak, and then the depth of it. Um, in the picture here, we're showing a we're showing a six by two corrugation profile, and then you see the the fifteen by five and a half. So when we're talking about buried bridges, that's usually what we're talking about, and that's going to be the focus on the case studies that I'm presenting today. Um, one of the benefits of the deep corrugation profile is that it's much stiffer. 
It's it's over six times stiffer than aluminum structural plate and over nine times stiffer than the steel. And additionally, the the steel is, is about a third stronger than the than the six by two material and over double the strength of the aluminum. So ultimately what that means is you can do longer spans and carry more loads. Um, in addition to that, with the flexibility and differential settlement tolerance benefits, um, there are a lot of applications for these types of structures. I'm not gonna go into a lot of detail on these, but um, up, up here is just a kind of a, a partial list. A lot of these end up crossing water so they're, they started out as drainage structures with the shallow corrugated structures. And, you know, with the deep corrugated, we can just cross bigger drainage areas. But lately, I've been doing a lot more with bridge replacements, grade separations. Um, structurally, they're, they're redundant and they're resilient. They're, it's a resilient material. Um, you can do a lot to it and not, and not lose the structure. Um, lots of advantages to the, one of the biggest ones usually is the foundations are going to be lower cost than almost any other bridge option that you would have. Um, I've done I've done some bridge replacements without taking the original bridges out of service, um, which is a little bit unique to these. So um, lots of benefits there as well. When you're looking at uh, when you're looking at evaluating one of these structures as an alternative for a bridge, you know the the big picture is what what I'm looking for is we need to know what does the structure have to fit around and then how much room do we have to fit it into. So when you're looking at a traditional bridge, usually you're spanning from, from bank to bank, you know, some sort of embankment here, whether it's crossing water or, or another road or something. Um, you don't really, when you're looking at a buried bridge alternative, you're not looking at the same span. You're just looking at something that can fit around what the bridge is crossing, whether it's, uh, you know, hydraulic, uh, you know, a certain minimum stream width or a clearance box or whatever. And then how much space do we have to fit the structure into from where the, the top of the footing is going to be to the road grade above? Um, and if you're replacing a bridge in place, it's helpful to know what the what the height of the lower cord of the bridge, existing bridge is, so we can si see if we can size the structure and fit in there. Um, there is an article about this uh, that was put out a a couple of years ago that's actually linked to on the short span steel bridge website. So if you download this presentation, there's a live uh, web link in there where you can get, get directly to that and learn about this process in a little bit more detail. So getting into the case studies, uh, the, the first one here is in gray main. Um, this, is a, this is a bridge replacement for a 20 foot span uh, steel bridge. Uh, just reached the end of its life. And what, what they wanted to do here was really do minimal disturbance of the site. They wanted to reuse the existing bridge abutments. Those were actually incorporated into the foundation. Uh, they didn't have any didn't have any flexibility to change the road grade, so that was pretty well set. So in terms of sizing the structure, it, it basically had to fit on around the existing foundation and and provide enough cover to, to meet all the design requirements for the traffic above. So there, there's one view of the, the original bridge. It was just a pretty basic, simple span, about 20 feet. You have these, these stubby concrete uh, wing walls on it that extended from the abutments. Um, you know, so you know, we're probably pretty pretty typical of, of a lot of uh, a lot of counties and rural rural roads, I would think. Uh, the project was specified as an aluminum box culvert where they were going to um, build a new footing right next to the existing bridge abutment and dowel into it. So they were partially supporting the, the new bridge with the existing bridge as they were doing that. Uh, during the bidding process, we, we value engineered that into a deep corrugated steel structure. The co costs were pretty comparable, but the construction costs were a little bit less because of the of the stiffer material and stronger material, we didn't have to have ribs on the structure, which saved a little bit on the construction time. So the contract, each each uh, each plate on this was 30 inches wide, and it consisted of three plates with each ring. So the contractor off to the side pre-assembled three rings at a time and then lifted them into place on the foundation using a backhoe. Um, this process w went pretty quick. I think he. He had the full whole thing assembled in about half a day. 
um, and then you're able to start backfilling right away after that. On this project, we used a, uh, a mechanically stabilized earth head wall that had the uh, structural plate facing. This is that six by two corrugation profile, uh, just flat sheets. Um, so one neat thing with this is uh, it, it's very, very quick and easy. It consists basically of two components and you can backfill these walls about as fast as you can backfill the structure. Um, one difference between this and what and what you might be familiar with if you if you looked at alumina box culverts is uh, this is not an anchored head wall system. It's a true MSE wall. So you don't have to have the whalers and you don't use dead men or anything like that. Um, the the, um, the MSE material is this grid strip that just attached directly to the facing material. So it, it came up with a, the result was a, a nice, nice sleeker look, a bigger span structure. Um, the, the existing abutments did a pretty good job of providing scour protection there. So the next case study is, is a little ways from there in St. Johnsbury, Vermont. This is a replacement for a 139 foot three, three span steel and concrete build bridge built in the thirties. Um, originally there was a, there was a rail line that went through here that's been, that had been since been converted to a pedestrian trail. Um, but one of the design requirements on this was still to do use that single track arima clearance because once, once that right away is there that it's never completely given up. So that was one challenge we had. And then they, they had, they didn't really have the ability to change the road grade at all either. So there was sort of a tight window to fit the structure into. Um, this is a pretty hilly and, and somewhat, I don't know if you'd call it mountainous or not, but there, this is an area where there aren't a lot of detours. So there were some incentives for the contractor to do the project quickly. Um, that was always kind of at the top of everybody's mind as we were developing the solution here and, and working with them on how best to support that. Um, the contractor who who built this had never built one of these structures before, and he was able to complete the assembly in about a day and a half. And they had the whole project done in about 45 days. Um, one one interesting thing that we did on this was the 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 engineer was going was anticipating about three or three and a half inches of settlement of the embankment soils because you're they're adding new fill out here. For the roadways so they they decided to design the foundations for the same level of settlement and that allowed them to increase the bearing pressures enough so that they could use precast concrete footings which also saved a lot of time and during construction um, this is a view of the original bridge there um, the, there was some desire to to somehow incorporate the original look of the of these concrete guardrails with the final solution they knew they couldn't replicate it completely, but that, you know, from an aesthetic standpoint, this was sort of a community project. So everybody had input on what this was going to look like. Um, but from our standpoint, it's still just another bridge replacement project. One thing that we had to deal with, with, uh, with the size of the structure as well, was making it fit between these existing bridge piers uh, because they built the foundations before they tore out the original bridge. Uh, the this this structure consisted of five plates for each ring. Um, the contractor started out started out assembly by by building two two rings on their side on the ground and then they lifted them into place on the footing using two backhoes. Um, I, I have a, a video of them doing this, which is pretty impressive. Uh, we don't have time to show it here, but uh, if you'd like, I'd be happy to to do that another time. Um, but it, it's pretty, it was kind of impressive that they could stand these up and then walk together and set it at the right place on the footing. Um, the The contractor also expedited assembly by, by pre-assembling the three crown plates of the structure off to the side. So after he had the initial two rings set, then he would just attach two side plates on either side and then come in with the crown plates. And then this structure did have some crown ribs on it because we had because of that tight window we had between the rail clearance and the road, uh, we needed to um, we ended up having to to get below the minimum ash till uh, cover requirements for this structure and adding those crown ribs was one way to um, to get around that requirement or or to to meet that requirement by adding that special feature. Uh, this structure also had used uh, MSE head walls. It's the same 
the, the pretty much the same design that we used on, on the previous project, only this one has precast panel facing on it. Uh, but the design is the same. The only thing difference here is the facing material. Um, and, and this this wall is also on a curve. So that, that's on a, you can see that a little bit in this picture here, there's a little bit of a curve. That was pretty easy to handle with, with, the, with an MSC wall as it went over the structure. Um, after it was done, they, they put a finished collar on the ends here to sort of cover up the gaps around the, the plates. And then um, then they built uh, over the crown, they have uh, they used a, uh, a moment slab for the guardrail. Um, so it's somewhat, somewhat of a decorative rail that they have up there as well. So, all right. So I I'm, looks like I'll have time to get into a few of those snapshots. Uh, th this project here is, uh, I talked about in a webinar last summer uh, during the series that Short Span Steel Bridge Alliance did last summer. If you want to download the uh, the slides from that from that presentation as well of, as a video of it being presented, you can do that through these links here. Um, so those are some of the bonus material. And stop stop me when I need to stop, Dr. Barker. Uh, the, this is uh, another bridge replacement project in Ohio under I-75. This was a 150 foot long structure replacing. They, they were going from I think four lanes to six lanes on the interstate. So they wanted to replace <clears throat> replace the, this bridge with uh, with a buried bridge. Um, so we built that and slid it into place underneath the one of the original bridges, and then they just kept moving lanes around as they as they backfilled and replaced the structure and stages without having to do any detours. Uh, another is another another bridge project in Nebraska. We were, we designed for rail loading. This is for a loop track into uh, uh, an agricultural facility. Uh, th this was sized to accommodate two semis passing each other on the, on the road and also to carry train loading over the top of it. Um, another, another bridge project, this is into a kind of a congested area in, in uh, metropolitan Houston area. Um, limited, limited, uh, access in and out of this site that they were building. So they did this in stage construction as they were doing some of the final design on it. We were able to do uh, do it, build about half of the structure and then backfill it with, uh, they actually backfilled this with re recycled concrete. Um, so if sustainability is one of your goals, that's something that's, that's an option in a lot of projects as well. Another great separation in Kansas with uh, Barry Bridge carrying a county road over uh, over a twin track. That was, was a spur line into a power plant. Um, they had, they added a track, which meant that they had to separate the grades there. Uh, so we were able to accommodate that, and they used MSC walls again to, to uh, for an alternative or, or kind of a different uh, different layout based on the grades the the grading that they had going on there. All right, Joel, those are great examples. Thank you. And I know you have a few more pictures, but uh, you also have quite a few questions, good questions in the Q&A that we want to give you a chance to answer. Okay. And we will we will let uh, Sean start his presentation. All right, looks good, good, Sean. Yep, you're all good. Great. Okay. Uh, thanks for joining us today. Um, I'm Sean Johnson, the engineering manager for Girder Bridges at Contech. Uh, today we'll be looking at the uh, Mecham Creek Union Pacific Railroad Access Bridge Project. I'd like to start with our learning objectives. The February 2020 flooding event in Eastern Oregon impacted Mecham Creek, 37 mile tributary of the Umatilla River. And three bridges were damaged along the Union Pacific, uh, along the Union Pacific Railroad's remote service road. The damage to the bridges and roadway left the Union Pacific with no service access to the railroad system 
and it was imperative to restore that access as quickly as possible. Contact Engineered Solutions worked with Union Pacific Railroad, the engineer, HDR, and the contractor, Hamilton Construction, to come up with a solution for the bridges, for the bridge crossings, that would allow the use of accelerated bridge construction, ABC, techniques, while providing a cost-effective, a cost-efficient project. The solution utilized Big R Bridge rolled girder bridges by contact. The bridge used weathering steel rolled W-shaped girders and galvanized steel bridge plank decking, allowing for the gravel wearing surface. Big R rolled girder bridges were determined to be the most cost-effective solution that could meet the accelerated time frame. The bridges were ordered on March 9th of 2020. The plans were submitted on April 4th. The bridges were shipped mid-May. And the installation was complete on July 2nd of 2020. So just under four months from time of order to completion of the bridge installations on site. The three bridges are all 14 foot wide, each with different lengths and span configurations. The first bridge is a 200 foot long bridge consisting of a 120 foot main span and 40 foot approach spans. The second bridge is 220 foot long consisting of a 100-foot main span and 60-foot approach spans. The last bridge is 40-foot long and is a single-span bridge. The bridges were designed in accordance with AASHTO LRFD bridge design specifications 8th edition. HL93 vehicle loading was used for the design. Full self, self weight dead load plus 80 pounds per square foot of gravel wearing surface, as well as an additional 45 pounds per linear foot for future bridge railing is used in the design. And site specific wind and seismic loading is also considered in the design. The bridge rail, as detailed and provided with the bridges, is design rated for TL1 loading, but has not been crash tested. The TL1 loading is taken from AASHTO Appendix A 13.2, and the rail system, including the impact to the girder, is designed for that loading. The 200 foot and the 220 foot bridges are designed as multiple spans, multiple simple spans placed end to end. You can see that a cover angle is utilized at the joints between the bridges to keep the gravel wearing surface from falling through the joint. The 120 foot and 100 foot spans are designed with bolted beam splices in order to accommodate shipping. A bolted bearing block design was used for the top flanges as not to interfere with the steel deck plank. Since these bridges are simple spans, there will be no tension in the top flange connection after it is put into service. However, tension must be considered 
in the design for the installation and placement of the modules. The bridges were shop fabricated in modular sections in our Greeley, Colorado shop. The shop is AISC Advanced Bridge Certified with Fracture Critical and Sophisticated Paint Endorsements. The bridges were fabricated and delivered in two beam modules with the deck shop installed. Foundations utilize steel piles with precast bent caps and abutments in order to accelerate construction on site. Here you see the precast elements staged on sites on site an installed abutment, and an installed bent. The bridge modules were unloaded and staged on site. Depending on the site conditions and timing, the modules can be unloaded from the truck and set directly onto the foundations. However, this site did not accommodate that. Here's another shot of bridge modules being staged on site. Bridge modules were assembled into full length and or full width sections, depending on the total lift weight and the capacity of the crane. A full 40 foot span is shown here with the bridge rail post pre-installed. The bridge post can be installed before or after the bridge is set, depending on the crane, crane capacity and the site conditions. Bolted girder splices are assembled before setting bridge sections. In this photo, you can see some creative use of site materials to help keep the web splice plate spaced so the other end could be easily swung into place. You can see where they wedged rocks between the plate and the web. Pretty sure they got those on site. All splice bolts are put in place and snug tightened. And then they are tensioned using, using turn of nut procedures. The assembled bridge sections or modules are then lifted and set into place on the foundations. Here you see a 2B module being lifted. The modules then being lined up and finally the module set in place and the rigging release so the crane can go get the next module. Here we see both modules in place. Here, we see a fully assembled 40 foot span being lifted. Here is the 220 foot bridge fully assembled and set, ready for the gravel wearing surface. Here, 
we see the finished 200 foot bridge. The existing railroad truss bridge can be seen behind the, the roll girder bridge. Another shot of the finished 200 foot bridge. And another shot of the finished 200 foot bridge. Here we can see the finished 220 foot bridge. And another shot of the finished 220 foot bridge. Here, we see the finished 40 foot bridge. And another shot of the 40 foot bridge with some equipment being run over the top. Some project highlights. Collaboration between the owner, engineer, contractor, and bridge supplier led to coming up with the best solution for the site. The use of modular bridge construction and precast foundation elements accelerated construction in the field. The supplied bridge system meets AASHTO loading. And we have an end product that satisfied all parties and will provide a long lasting solution for the crossing. Since I started with the Ron Swanson quote, I thought it would be nice to end with one as well. It's my pleasure presenting today and thank you for your time.